this is our N95 decontamination and reuse webinar. Um, all right, next slide, please. So just gonna give a quick background on who we are. Um, N95 Decon is a consortium of over 100 scientists from now at this point over 15 different institutions. Um, and we assembled uh, early on in this COVID crisis around the idea of expanding uh, uh, the use of protective equipment and the protective equipment that is available for the frontline workers. Um, our goal is to be as un unbiased and interdisciplinary as possible. Um, we're composed of MDs, PhDs, RNs, and students. Um, and our goal is to evaluate the existing scientific literature on N95 decontamination methods to find out which are, you know, which specific methods are scientifically validated to be safe and effective and which ones are not. Um, so we've done this by publishing technical reports and fact sheets, which are on our website at n95decon.org, um, and have also been coordinating and executing some internal research. Um, we're completely independent, we're fully volunteer based, um, and our publications are subjected to rigorous internal review and debate. Um, so our goal is really to provide the best information um, that the world knows uh, to folks on the front line. Um, next slide, please. So in today's session, we're going to be talking first a bit about uh, some background for what personal protective equipment is used for COVID-19, uh, a little bit into the, the details of the N95 uh, respirators and fundamental principles and considerations for N95 decontamination. Um, then this is gonna get followed up with the, the three primary methods for N95 decontamination, uh, UVC, heat, hydrogen peroxide vapor, um, and the wait and reuse method, just allowing the virus to inactivate over time. Um, and you know, our goal really is to, to fundamentally, after this webinar, you should have a great understanding of the considerations when evaluating N95 decontamination protocols that may be done at your hospital. So this is specifically filtration efficiency, fit, bioburden reduction, and hazards that are associated with each method. Um, so with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Ashley to give, get you started with PPE for COVID-19. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Ashley Stichinski, and I'm an Infectious Disease Fellow at Stanford University, and my primary focus is on IPC in low-resource settings. Before we jump into talking about N95s, I'm going to give a brief overview of the necessary PPE to protect against COVID-19 with a focus on low-resource settings. Healthcare workers are especially vulnerable to becoming infected with SARS-CoV-2, as we've seen in Italy, Spain, Russia, and even the US. However, with appropriate use of PPE, healthcare worker infections are largely preventable, even in settings with low resources. Next slide. Next slide. I just want to make the point here that PPE is only one of many strategies to reduce the risk to healthcare workers and it is the least effective. PPE use should be coupled with strategies that minimize the amount of virus present in the healthcare facility. For example, triage and cohorting systems can reduce healthcare workers from becoming exposed to potentially infected individuals. Similarly, improving ventilation or enhancing hand washing can lower the burden of infectious particles in the environment. Next slide. To understand what PPE is required, we first have to understand how SARS-CoV-2 is transmitted. Here we have an overview of the chain of infection. We start with an infectious agent, which in this case is SARS-CoV-2. Next. And this is the virus that causes COVID-19. The reservoir of this virus can be either asymptomatic or symptomatic individuals. Recent estimates suggest that 25 or even up to 50% of people may be asymptomatic but can still be spreading the virus. The virus is typically released into the environment in the context of respiratory secretions, which can be generated by coughing, sneezing, singing, or even talking. We know that people can become infected through three main modes of transmission. Next. This includes droplet, contact, and aerosol routes. 
And this is because there are receptors for the virus in the nasal epithelium as well as the lower respiratory tract. Thus, the virus cannot enter through intact skin. The only way for contact transmission to occur is when the virus is passed from a surface to a susceptible mucous membrane. We don't know the relative impact of droplet versus aerosol transmission. The major difference is how close you have to be to the source, within one to two meters for droplets or more than two meters for aerosols, and the size of the particles. Aerosols are much smaller than droplets and can be maintained in the air. Right now, we believe that transmission is largely driven by droplets with some exceptions in the healthcare setting when aerosol generating procedures are performed such as intubation, CPR, or collection of nasal swabs. And anyone is potentially a susceptible host. Next. Next. The type of PPE required depends on the modes of transmission that you may be exposed to, as we just discussed. So for example, if you are entering a cohort area but have no patient contact, you only will need a surgical mask as your main risk is for droplet transmission. If, however, you're providing direct, hands-on patient care, you need protection against droplet and contact transmission. So in addition to a surgical mask, you need gowns and gloves. Additionally, because of the risk of close range droplets directly onto mucous membranes, facial protection is also required. If you are at risk of aerosols, such as if you are performing an aerosol generating procedure, a surgical mask is no longer sufficient. You'll need additional respiratory protection, such as from an N95 or FFP2, to filter out smaller particles. Cleaners of COVID wards and laboratory technicians require similar protection to healthcare workers, as do visitors. This set of recommendations for use of PPE during COVID is supported by both WHO and CDC. Next. slide. Next slide, please. Are the slides visible? We're having a small technical issue, if you'll bear with us for one second. Sure. So just to keep the presentation moving, I can discuss uh, the evidence for the different PPE recommendations. Oh, now we have it, perfect, okay. So a systematic review of the interventions to prevent spread of respiratory viruses supports the current recommendations for PPE use during COVID-19. This systematic review is largely based on studies conducted with RSV, respiratory syncytial virus transmission, and during the first SARS outbreak. Given the similarities in transmission routes, we anticipate these same strategies will be effective for COVID-19. Frequent hand washing and mask wearing were the most robust interventions, maintaining significance across multivariable models in multiple studies. Notably, mask wearing included the use of either surgical or cloth masks. Given the overlapping confidence intervals, it's difficult to identify a single most important intervention, but each of these components demonstrated good efficacy, providing 50 to 90% protection. Next. While PPE is a good thing, more PPE does not mean more protection. Two items that are not required to protect against COVID are head coverings and shoe covers. This is because the virus is not transmitted in a way that makes either of these likely pathways for propagating disease spread. In fact, 
healthcare workers are at highest risk of becoming exposed to the virus during doffing or removal of PPE. And in particular, removal of shoe covers and head covers results in some of the highest rates of self-contamination. When considering these figures, it may actually be riskier to wear too much PPE. Next. To reduce the risk of self-contamination, it's important to follow safe don doffing practices. The most important thing to remember is to avoid touching the outside of the PPE, which can be contaminated. Gloves should be removed first, as these are likely to be the most contaminated. You can do so by pinching in the middle of a glove and peeling it off. Then hold the removed glove in your gloved hand, slide your fingers under the ungloved hand of the remaining glove at the wrist, and peel off the second glove over the first one. For step two, you can remove your face protection by lifting the head strap and earpieces from the back. For step three, pull a gown down and away from the neck and shoulders, only touching the inside of the gown. Fold or roll into a bundle and discard. For step four is to remove the mask, which we will demonstrate later in this presentation. And perhaps the most important, step five, is to wash your hands after removing PPE. Next slide. What if your facility has limited PPE? There are three ways you can continue to protect yourself even in the face of limited PPE supplies. These strategies are inferior to standard recommendations for PPE, but they are supported by both WHO and CDC as mitigation strategies during times of limited resources. The first strategy is extended use. This refers to wearing PPE for longer than a single patient encounter. When you are caring for multiple patients with the same diagnosis, for example, COVID-19, you can wear the same PPE for the duration of the shift as long as it is not soiled or damaged. Decontamination and reuse is another way to extend the life of PPE. Decontamination reduces the risk for self-contamination, making reuse a safer possibility. However, it is important to use a decontamination method that is effective without compromising the quality of the PPE. Finally, substitution is a last resort option when there is no PPE available. This refers to using non-standard materials to provide protection. Though PPE substitutes will offer less protection than standard PPE, they can be used to provide limited protection when nothing else is available. Next. Regardless of whether you have any PPE, hand hygiene remains one of the most important ways for healthcare pro providers to protect themselves. In the setting of COVID-19, washing with soap and water or alcohol-based hand rub are considered equally effective methods for hand hygiene. In a recent study of risk factors for healthcare workers becoming infected with SARS-CoV-2, suboptimal hand washing was on par with improper PPE use for risk to healthcare workers. This is a reminder that the basics of infection prevention still hold true and remain of paramount importance for protecting healthcare workers. One of the most critical components of PPE to protect healthcare workers during COVID is use of a face mask. This is because droplet and to some extent aerosol transmission are the main drivers for SARS-CoV-2 spread. N95 and FFP2 masks offer the most protection against both droplets and aerosols. As such, they should be reserved for use during aerosol generating procedures. A surgical mask provides protection primarily against droplets. This is an appropriate level of protection for most activities in the healthcare setting. A cloth mask should only be considered if no surgical masks are available. Per WHO recommendations, N95 and FFP2 and surgical masks can be worn for up to six hours at a time. I won't discuss decontamination of N95 since we'll be going into that in more detail later. For surgical masks, CDC allows for limited reuse, although WHO recommends discarding surgical masks after each use to minimize the risk of contamination to healthcare workers. If you are to reuse the mask, you must remain mindful that the outer surface could be contaminated. If no N95 or FFP2 masks are available and you must perform aerosol generating procedures, surgical masks offer the next best protection, particularly if combined with a face shield. Cloth masks should always remain a last resort. Next. If you must use a cloth mask, a tightly woven cotton, especially when combined with other types of fabric, can provide reasonable filtration efficiency. 
However, effectiveness will depend not only on the type of cloth, but also on a secure fit around the mouth and nose. If you'll notice in this graph, even with an N95 mask, having a gap substantially decreases the effectiveness. So material is as important as fit. Next. The main purpose of gloves is to reduce the amount of virus that ends up on your hands. However, remember that virus on your hands does not itself lead to infection unless your hands contact a viable portal of entry, namely your mucous membranes, including eyes, nose, and mouth. The same reduction in virus can also be achieved with more thorough hand washing. Thus, gloves are primarily a way to enhance hand hygiene. The ideal practice is to change gloves between every patient to ensure that you're not spreading infections between patients. However, if you have a limited supply of gloves, Research has shown that alcohol-based hand rub can be applied to latex and nitro gloves up to 30 times without compromising the protection of the gloves. If you have absolutely no gloves available, extended hand washing can provide equivalent protection. Next. A face shield or goggles is recommended to reduce the risk of droplets directly contacting the mucous membrane of the eyes, such as if someone sneezes or coughs very nearby. Is there a difference between goggles and face shields? Yes and no. Both WHO and CDC recognize goggles and face shields as sufficient eye protection. However, we know from other studies that face shields can further reduce the risk of contaminating the outer portion of masks. Since doffing is a high-risk procedure for virus transmission, reducing external contamination can minimize risk to healthcare workers. Additionally, face shields offer 68 to 96% reduction in aerosol exposure so they can enhance the efficacy of face masks. During the first SARS outbreak, researchers found a three-fold reduction in SARS infections among nurses who wore face shields compared with those who did not. Furthermore, face shields can be locally produced with inexpensive materials. Either a face shield or goggles can be reused indefinitely as long as visibility is not compromised. Decontamination can be performed with a range of dis disinfectants as long as it doesn't compromise the visibility. If you find yourself without either a face shield or goggles, there are many options for making your own face shield, such as with a two liter soda bottle. As long as it covers forehead to chin and ear to ear, it can be effective. Next. Next slide. Oh, perfect. A gown is intended to reduce contamination of clothing and subsequent contact transmission. There are no specific recommendations by CDC or WHO on acceptable gown material. The only requirement is having fluid resistant protection if splashes or sprays are anticipated or during aerosol generating procedures. A gown can be worn for the duration of a shift and less soiled. If it is a reusable gown, it should be laundered at least daily. If no gowns are available, lab coats, aprons, or layered clothing can be used. Next. Next slide. So we've summarized these recommendations in an infographic that we're happy to share. This can be a useful tool to hang in a healthcare facility to remind healthcare workers how best to protect themselves. All right, thank you so much, Ashley, for your talk. Um, at this time, we're going to take a couple questions just to introduce myself. I'm a grad student at Stanford, um, and I study electrical engineering. And my uh, co-moderator is Lynn. Would you like to introduce yourself? Oh, apologies. I was on mute. Hi, everybody. My name is Lynn Stoller, and I am working on public health implementation with N95 Decon. Thank you. Um, Ashley, we have a question about coveralls. All the EMTs we are seeing are wearing coveralls. Is this safer than my gown and should we have them in the hospital? So we know from Ebola that the risk for doffing and self-contamination is greater with coveralls than with a gown. So if you have the option to use a gown that's more easy to remove than coveralls, that would be preferable because it's gonna be safer for you ultimately. During COVID, we don't think that there's any need for full coveralls, that a gown that covers the front is sufficient. Great, thank you. Um, Lynn, do you have the next question? Yes, our next question is from a participant. Uh, it asks, should you wash your face as well? 
So washing one's face is not a particular recommendation in regards to IPC. Again, face primarily uh, is, we think of as intact skin, but certainly your face is close to a lot of mucous membranes. So if you, for example, are taking care of patients with COVID all day and you, especially if you don't have access to a face shield to provide that full face protection, it's probably a good idea at the end of the day before you go home, just to make sure that you're minimizing risk of transferring any virus into your mucous membranes to wash your face or maybe even take a shower so you're not taking any of that virus home with you. Wonderful, thank you so much. Next up, we have a presentation from Kezi Cheng. Great, hello, good afternoon. My name is Kezi Chen. I am a, a member of the N95 DCOM group. I'm also a PhD student studying material science at Harvard University. And today I will be discussing the background on N95 masks before we dive into further decontamination methods. Next. Is this, oh, great, okay. So as Ashley previously said, there are many types of masks and these masks range in the protection it provides the users. On the left side here, you see um, homemade masks as well as medical and surgical masks. And on the right, we have um, very high protection that it provides for the users, such as powered air purifying respirators. And in between, we have uh, FFRs, which are filtering face piece respirators, such as N95s and elastomeric respirators in, um, in the red and the orange boxes. Under typical situations, N95s are disposable, whereas elastomeric respirators are reusable for non-biohazardous work. Here we will focus on FFRs, particularly N95s, that could be reused and decontaminated due to supply constraints around the world. Next. As you saw on the previous slide, there are many models of N95s and many types of masks. In addition, there are also many international equivalents of NIOSH-approved N95s, such as the European FFP2 respirators and China's KN95s, um, Australia's P2s. However, these FFRs are designed for a range of purposes. For, for example, filtering out non-oil-based particles, such as those resulting from wildfires, PM2.5 pol air pollution, as well as bioaerosols. And if you look on the table on the right, these different masks are tested under different requirements, such as flow rates uh, for filtration efficiency and pressure drop. So prior to selecting a respirator, users should consult with their local public health authorities to, for selection guidance. Next. Here, um, there are some updated, a number of documents updated by the FDA and the CDC regarding N95 equivalent masks. For example, um, uh, there's a list on counterfeits and misrepresentation of NIOSH approved masks. We also have, um, EUA, so emergency authorization for authorized import and non-NIOSH approved FFRs from other countries as well as from China. So please take a look at these documents before selecting or purchase N95 equivalents. Next. The name N95 respirator is pretty descript descriptive in its functionality. The N stands for non-oil resistance, whereas the R stands for oil resistant and P stands for oil proof. The number 95 stands for 95% of the particles um, being able to be filtered out. 100 means greater than 99.7%, uh, 99 means 99% is filtered. The word respirator implies that all inhaled air is filtered if worn properly. A mask implies a barrier in which um, which may not be sealed. A surgical means that there is a hydrophobic splash barrier on the mask. Next. So the N95 respirator is worn to protect people from hazardous substances while allowing airflow. It doesn't protect users from vapors or gas. 
So particles in the air that contain the virus could come in many, many droplet sizes and are not necessarily all as small as the virus. These could be produced by breathing, coughing, speaking by an infected person. Breathing in these particles through the nose and mouth or transporting particles there by touching your face is a primary transmission pathway for COVID-19. Next. The, the two important functionalities of um, N95 is having a good seal around the face and a good filter such that harmful particles do not go through the mask. The N95 consists of several layers of which the middle layer is a filter layer and the outer and inner layers are for support and comfort. <clears throat> These layers are made of polymeric materials. And in addition, there's typically a nose clip that's aluminum that molds to the nose for a better seal. Um, this uh, nose piece could be a potential barrier for uh, microwaving the mask. The straps are either around the ears or behind the head to, to hold the mask in place. And in certain N95s, there are um, cellulose material, and cellulose material is incompatible with hydrogen peroxide vapor decontamination method. Next. So I'll talk a little bit about the filtration and the fit of an N95. In the filter layer, there is an electric filter media that is made of a melt-blown, non-woven polypropylene material. This material traps respiratory droplets by electrostatic charge attraction, and therefore the fibers um, can have relatively large pores and allow for good uh, airflow and breathability while preventing uh, harmful particles from coming in. A tight seal is equally as important, and users must perform a seal check each time they don a mask and also a fit check once a year. Filter efficiency can be greatly reduced through physical damage of the mask or the loss in electrostatic charge. And seal can be greatly reduced through improper donning as well as poor fit, facial hair, structural degradation of the mask, um, straps, and the nose piece. So to summarize, when we think about decontaminating these masks, in addition to killing any virus that might be present, it's also essential to ensure both fit and filtration standards are preserved after the process. So respirators that protect you from inhaling particles have been designed for different types of settings. On the left here, we're showing a respirator intended for medical use, whereas on the right here, we have a respirator intended for industrial use, like sanding. A key difference is the valve versus non valve N95, and it's the protection it has for the wearer versus the protection it has for the users. So the vent on, uh, on the right allows unfiltered exhalation, which should not be used in healthcare settings. Next. There, there have been many counterfeits of N95s, like I mentioned uh, previously, and it's important to do mask validation through batch testing of the masks. There are some ways that manufacturers validate if N95 masks meet spec, and these can be performed in um, labs, academic labs, or through third-party vendors. And you can find specifications for these tests using the NIOSH standard TSI-8130. The filtration efficiency is the percentage of particles that are blocked by the filter. So the higher the filtration efficiency, the better the mask is. To perform filtration efficiency, the N-series um, FFRs are tested at a flow rate of 85 liters per minute using charge-neutralized um, charge polydispersed sodium chloride aerosols. The N95s achieve particle filtration efficiency of greater than 95% for particle sizes that range from 0.02 to 0.3 micrometers. So these masks are also tested for pressure drop, and pressure drop is the resistance to airflow across the mask. The greater resistance means that it will be harder for, uh, for the user to breathe. Um, and with that, I will stop to pause for discussion and questions. Wonderful, thank you so much, Kezi. We have a question here that has to do with alternatives to N95. Because of the shortage of N95 respirators, we're seeing a lot of KN95s. Are these equivalent to N95 in terms of reuse and decontamination? Yeah, thank you, Lynn. Um, 
So uh, like I mentioned before, um, before choosing a, a 95 equivalent, it's important to look through some of the documents that FDA and CDC presented um, to make sure that you have an effective, uh, for example, KN95, um, because there are many counterfeits on the market. And a lot of these do not um, perform up to standards for, for the NIOSH, NIOSH standards. However, as long as the uh, N95 equivalent has been NIOSH authorized and approved, as well as verified for filtration and fit, and it does not contain cellulose, um, the decontamination methods that we talk about today should be comparable to the N95s. Wonderful, thank you. And next, we have presenting Dr. Nicole Starr. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. I'm Nicole Starr. I'm a general surgery resident at University of California, San Francisco, and the senior research fellow at LifeBox Foundation. Today, I'll share a little more information about ensuring you have the right fit of your N95 mask, as well as proper donning and doffing technique. Next slide, please. When it comes to wearing an N95, the first step is usually a fit test. In the United States, fit testing for N95s is a required procedure. This determines the model and size of N95 mask that best fits to your face to ensure a tight seal. While it is usually required annually, during the COVID-19 pandemic, our occupational health guidance has changed so that any previous fit testing result is accepted and annual testing was suspended. Fit testing is rarely used in low resource settings, so I want to explain the process in detail. To do a fit test, the user first puts on a non-breathable hood, like you see in the photo. The tester then sprays either a bitter or sweet tasting aerosol substance under the hood. So the user has a baseline of what taste to expect during the test. The user then puts on an N95 mask and the process is repeated. This time the user should not taste the bitter or sweet taste from the aerosol if the mask fits properly. They also perform head turning and other maneuvers to make sure that moving the head does not allow any aerosol to enter. If the user tastes the substance, then they should adjust the straps, the mask position, and the nose piece, or try a different size or model until the test is passed. Once the user has a passing test, they should use that mask type and size going forward. Next slide. The donning, seal check, and doffing process is critically important to protect healthcare workers from aerosol transmission of illnesses. The key concerns of this process should be ensuring proper fit of the mask and preventing self-contamination. The seal check is also very important and ensures you have a tight seal to the face and aerosols cannot enter around the mask. This should be done every time you don the mask and can be done using positive or negative pressure. To don the mask, you want to use clean gloves or clean hands or gloves to cup the mask. Place it over your face and pull the upper strap over the crown of your head, followed by the lower strap down to your neck. You want to make sure the straps are straight and adjust the mask so it covers your nose and chin. Then press, don't pinch the nose piece so it fits to the bridge of your nose. Now you're ready to perform a seal check. For a negative pressure seal check, place your hands around the edges of the mask and inhale. You should feel the mask seal to your face and bow slightly inwards, and you should not feel air escaping around the edges. This is the best test for N95 masks with exhalation valves. For a positive pressure seal check, you wanna exhale against the mask. You should not feel air escape around the edges of the mask, and you should generate a slight positive pressure inside the mask before the seal is broken. To doff or remove N95s, you should take care not to contaminate yourself. You should remove the mask after exiting any patient area where aerosols may be present, and assume the front of your mask is contaminated. Perform hand hygiene first, then remove the lower strap first up and over your head. You want to grab the straps towards the back of your head, not close to the mask where they may be contaminated. Remove the lower strap up and over your head. 
This prevents the mask from falling forward onto your chest. Next, remove the upper strap and lift the N95 away from your face. Place it into a clean container for decontamination. Then perform hand hygiene before touching anything else. Next slide. Next slide, please. We may have a bit of a lag, so I'll keep going. Uh, there are some recommendations from the CDC on the extended use or reuse of PPE during the COVID-19 pandemic and the resulting PPE shortages, which Ashley previously touched on. Conservation strategies uh, for N95 should also include limiting personnel or clinical situations where N95s are used. Extended use is an option, which means wearing the N95 for longer periods of time without donning and doffing and has less risk of self-contamination than reuse, which involves multiple donning and doffing cycles. If you must use reuse, which means donning the N95 mask again without decontamination between patient encounters, make sure you have the proper storage container and don't share the masks between users. Looks like we're getting the slides uploaded again. So if you need to store and reuse your mask, there's a few things to consider. The storage containers must be breathable and you could use either a plastic container with holes punched in the top or a cardboard takeout container. This prevents the growth of mold or other bacteria on the mask during shortage. You can advance one more slide. And at the bottom of the slide, you see examples of those containers. Placing the mask face down and securing the straps over the side also prevents the contaminated side of the mask from touching multiple sides of the storage container. Make sure you either dispose of or decontaminate storage containers after every use. Do not reuse heavily contaminated N95s. For example, those used in aerosol generating procedures. These should be decontaminated right away. Don't share N95s between different users, and don't let the straps touch the front of the mask, as this will increase the chance of self-contamination. Next slide. N95 masks can be set aside for decontamination, either after aerosol generating procedures or after a certain time period of wear as designated by your hospital. N95s that are obviously soiled on the outside with blood or body fluids, or on the inside with makeup, or oils such as lotions or Vaseline, or are deformed or torn, should not be decontaminated. These must be thrown away. Now uh, we'll pause for another brief Q&A session. Thank you, Nicole. Um, we have a question that was um, submitted through the chat. Um, Nicole, shouldn't a fit test be done more and not less during a pandemic? This is a great question. Uh, it's done annually as part of our occupational health guidelines here. And um, some of the guidance we receive is that unless you've had a significant weight change or change in the shape of your face, the, the size and model of N95 that fits your face should not be expected to change within a short period of time. Uh, this contributes to the decision to lift uh, the annual fit testing requirements in the setting of the COVID-19 pandemic, as those fit testing sessions were also requiring close contact between uh, people at that time. And I would also just emphasize that a seal check at every use is still going to be your most important way of making sure that very mask fits to your face before that patient encounter. Wonderful. Nicole, we have another question for you. How do you determine the size of the N95 mask? So different models of N95 masks sometimes come in different sizes. For example, the 3M mask here comes in small, medium, and large sizes, I believe. Um, your hospital may not have access to all these, which is why it's important as well to do the seal check. Um, yeah, that's all. 
Great, I think um, now we are ready for Tyler's presentation. All right, fantastic. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, and this is going to be the section on N95 decontamination, um, both on general principles uh, for what to think about when evaluating N95 decontamination, um, as well as three methods that have been shown to be more likely to be effective um, at decontamination. Um, uh, so I'm Tyler Chen. I'm a PhD student and bioengineering Knight Hennessy scholar at Stanford. Um, and this is the section on N95 decontamination. Next slide, please. So when evaluating different N95 decontamination methods, there are four key elements to consider. First of all, an effective decontamination method must not damage the N95's ability to filter particles. So that's that 95% of particles that's listed in the name. Um, secondly, the method must not damage the N95's fit, the tight seal to the face that Nicole talked about during the user seal check. Um, most importantly, obviously, this method must also reduce the bio burden on the N95. Um, what that means, it certainly needs to kill the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, and decontamination, if possible, should also shoot to kill other pathogens as well. Um, when decontaminating and reusing masks, it's always important to consider the risk uh, of infection not only from SARS-CoV-2, but also from other pathogens that may contaminate the mask before reuse. Um, and finally, the decontamination method should not leave hazardous residue that could pose a threat to the healthcare worker that's using the method. So in the evidence sections of this presentation, uh, I'll be presenting some evidence supporting three decontamination approaches, uh, as well as some of their risks and limitations. Um, but I wanna make sure it's clear, the majority of the sources we cite in this presentation have either gone through peer review or have been implemented by hospitals. Um, we want to note a word of caution around preprint studies uh, since uh, non-peer reviewed literature varies widely in quality and may have some inaccuracies in their approach. Um, for the peer reviewed literature that we have used, we've denoted it with an asterisk uh, so that you can tell clearly what has been peer reviewed and what's not. Next slide, please. Awesome, so let's start off with N95 performance. So that's the filtration and fit questions. Um, Unfortunately, it's important to note that when, when you're considering how the decontamination is affecting the N95, uh, it's actually gonna be highly dependent on the decontamination method and the N95 model used. So we wanna be able to say that there's some one size fits all method for decontamination, regardless of the viral load, regardless of the mask, mask that you have. Um, but unfortunately, certain methods may damage fit or filtration after just a few cycles. Um, while others may allow more cycles before the mask performance becomes unacceptable. Um, and this actually also will depend on the exact mask bottle that's used. So it's important to review the, the more in-depth information we provide at n95decon.org slash publications, um, where we have extensive technical reports and fact sheets that have a listing of many N95 models and which uh, protocols have been tested on which models. Um, so even without decontamination, this is a very important point, even without doing any sort of decontamination protocol, there are some N95 models will lose their proper seal to the face after just putting the mask on five times. Um, others will lose fit after 15 times. So this indicates that even if you're not doing any of these decontamination protocols, the mask itself is losing its effectiveness over time, uh, over, over multiple donning and doffing events. Um, which means even more importantly is uh, that user seal check is very, very important for each reuse to make sure that it still seals to the face uh, if you're reusing the mask. Um, next slide, please. So in evaluating how effective any of these methods are for decontamination, we will consider the hierarchy of resistance of pathogens to disinfection. Some of the hardest organisms to kill are bacterial spores, so higher level disinfection methods achieve a six log reduction in viable bacterial spores. Um, log reduction is defined as a tenfold decrease in the concentration of the pathogen. Uh, therefore, a six log reduction effectively should reduce one million active pathogens down to one or less. Now for decontamination, our primary goal uh, for the emergency shortages from COVID-19 is inactivating the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Uh, this virus is an enveloped RNA virus and is relatively low on the resistance scale, as you can see with the box at the bottom. Um, the FDA recommends that we achieve at least a three log reduction against the virus for uh, emergency use authorization uh, of any decontamination procedure. 
Um, and this is defined as being able to reduce 1,000 active viruses down to one or less. Some methods we're going to discuss, such as humid heat, uh, may achieve three log reduction of the virus, but not of other bacteria and pathogens. So it's really important to remember that for each of these methods I'm about to discuss, uh, they have different levels of disinfection. Some you may also have to be concerned about other uh, pathogens that may remain on the mask. Next slide, please. So to start off, uh, this is addressing one of the questions in the chat. Um, here are some methods that have been shown not to be effective. So this is really important to make sure that these methods are not used for N95 decontamination. Um, these have been shown not to be effective uh, either because they damage the N95 filtration uh, or they do not inactivate the virus sufficiently. Um, so specifically, the methods that damage the N95 filtration are soap, um, alcohol, such as alcohol-based hand sanitizers, these will damage the N95 filtration, uh, bleach immersion, and gamma irradiation. Um, so these should not be used. Uh, there are other methods that do not sufficiently inactivate the virus. Um, so some folks have proposed storing the mask just overnight uh, without using it. Uh, that does not allow sufficient time for the virus to be inactivated. Um, also, UVA and UVB sources, uh, such as nail salons, tanning beds, home UV, uh, delivers an insufficient germicidal UVC dose to inactivate the virus. So these are also not effective. Similarly, sunlight does not contain any uh, significant amount of UVC, that germicidal wavelength, which I'll talk about in a bit. So sunlight also does not inactivate the virus based on studies that we've seen. Finally, um, it's important to remember that bringing potentially biohazardous masks home is highly dangerous and has significant contamination risk. So if you are carrying out decontamination due to emergency shortages, this should only occur in secure environments, such as at a hospital or at a third party provider. Next slide, please. So this is the summary of N95 decontamination principles. Um, and again, it's very, very important to think of these whenever you're evaluating how, how, how you should decontaminate an N95 if you have shortages. Um, obviously, the best thing that one can do is use a new N95, uh, but globally, we know that there is uh, a severe enough shortage that this may not be possible in all cases. So for decontamination, if this is required, it's very important to evaluate the N95 filtration efficiency, make sure that's preserved following the decontamination protocol. Similarly, the fit must be preserved. Um, so the bio burden inactivation must achieve at least a three log reduction of SARS-CoV-2 and preferably a sterilization method should be used which can achieve greater than six log reduction of bacterial spores as well. Uh, and finally, hazardous residues should be minimized to ensure that the healthcare workers are not exposed to uh, any hazards following decontamination. So with that, I'm gonna go into the decontamination methods that we're discussing. Um, these are vaporized hydrogen peroxide, UVC germicidal irradiation, humid heat, and finally the time, the wait and reuse method. Um, so let's get started. Next slide, please. So our first decontamination method for N95s is vaporized hydrogen peroxide. This method uses very specific instruments from companies including BioQuell and Steris that generate hydrogen peroxide vapor. Hydrogen peroxide is a strong sterilant and reacts with many biological substances to produce reactive oxygen species that destroy membrane lipids, proteins, and DNA and RNA. Uh, one benefit of vaporized hydrogen peroxide is that this method, uh, the vapor can penetrate dark spaces, unlike light, something like UVC, and the final breakdown products are non-harmful. These are water and oxygen. Um, this method, if you look at the left side uh, for coronavirus inactivation, this method has been shown to inactivate SARS-CoV-2 as well as more resistant organisms such as bacterial spores on the surface of an N95 after a manufacturer approved cycle. So this means that the vaporized hydrogen peroxide method is a high level disinfection method. Um, so there is less concern about other pathogens being present after a proper cycle. Um, it's also been shown that vaporized hydrogen peroxide does not damage the filter or straps of the N95 uh, after 20 cycles. So that means that the limit on reusability with the vaporized hydrogen peroxide method is going to be the loss of fit after donning and doffing alone. Um, it is important to note there are quite a few concerns about this method uh, that one should be aware of if one is implementing. Um, one of which is that hydrogen peroxide vapor is a respiratory hazard and requires highly controlled airflow to make sure that it is applied 
uh, in a way that is not venting hydrogen peroxide vapor to anywhere else in the facility, um, and sufficient aeration of the mask, leaving the mask out to uh, degas and remove that hydrogen peroxide vapor um, is required before reuse to ensure that no healthcare workers are exposed. Um, unfortunately, hydrogen peroxide vapor does require equipment that is usually expensive and does require trained personnel. Um, Another concern is that it is incompatible with cellulose, as mentioned earlier. So N95s that do not contain cellulose should be used if this method is, uh, just is desirable. Um, on our website at n95decon.org slash hydrogen peroxide, we have more information, including a list of, uh, in the appendix of our technical report on hydrogen peroxide, we have a list of which N95 models contain uh, cellulose and which ones do not. Um, to get a better idea of which masks might be compatible with this method. Uh, next slide, please. So this is a method summary for this uh, method that I've just described. Um, as said earlier, if properly executed, vaporized hydrogen peroxide may inactivate both viruses and bacterial spores by greater than six log. Um, but it's important to include a biological or chemical indicator for each cycle to make sure that you're delivering the full vaporized hydrogen peroxide uh, dose to each of the masks. Um, N95 performance uh, appears to hold up well under vaporized hydrogen peroxide and is uh, fit and filtration are preserved up to 20 cycles. Um, again, make sure that the N95 you're using does not contain cellulose. And you can check the cycle number that is allowed for each specific uh, manufacturer's vaporized hydrogen peroxide uh, equipment. Um, another important concern is the proper aeration of the N95s before use. Uh, we've gotten some questions for lower resource settings about the use of 6% liquid hydrogen peroxide to uh, decontaminate N95 masks. Um, this method is definitely accessible uh, worldwide, but unfortunately, the 6% liquid hydrogen peroxide immersion method has not yet been validated for the required aeration time to prevent any residue uh, from getting on the healthcare worker's face, um, and also has not been validated for viral inactivation. Um, there's some concern that the surface of the N95, since it's hydrophobic, may not be fully decontaminated by this method. Um, but there are studies in progress, so we will be updating these, these info on our website at n95decon.org slash hydrogen peroxide. Uh, so you can go there for more details. Next slide, please. All right, so we're moving on to our second method. This is uh, ultraviolet C, or UVC. Um, so you've probably heard quite a bit about using UV for decontamination. Um, specifically, what this refers to is the germicidal UVC region of the electromagnetic spectrum. So you see that purple line there. Um, so when we look at the spectrum on the right side, you see the different colors or wavelengths of visible light. Uh, and as you move down to lower wavelengths, uh, which is higher energy light, uh, we pass through the UVA and UVB regions, which are not very germicidal. Um, and then you enter the germicidal UVC wavelength range. Um, at very low wavelengths, uh, even lower than germicidal UVC, uh, the light can generate ozone from the air, which is a health hazard and is something to watch out for. So you may wonder why is this UVC region in particular germicidal? Um, and you can see this in the germicidal action plot right below uh, where that purple line leads. Um, so you see in this plot, it's got a little V shape. Uh, and there's a peak around 260 nanometers. Um, so what this plot shows is how effective light is at inactivating pathogens as a function of wavelength. So there's a peak at 260 nanometers, and this is because UVC irradiation inactivates pathogens by damaging their genomic material. And DNA and RNA have maximum UV absorption at 260 nanometers, so the increased efficacy of decontamination uh, in this range is why the wavelength surrounding 260 nanometers is typically used for UV decontamination. Next slide, please. Um, so when you're within that germicidal UVC range, the evidence from peer-reviewed literature suggests that an irradiation dose, which represents the integrated intensity of light delivered to the N95, so not only is it just the amount of time that it is exposed to the light, but it's also the amount of uh, light intensity that is delivered over that time. Um, the the uh, total irradiation dose of a minimum of one joule per centimeter squared is required to inactivate viruses similar to SARS-CoV-2 on N95 material. Um, 
So it's important to note that the N95 straps are not as effectively decontaminated by UVC, so they may require a secondary decontamination, such as uh, wiping with a compatible disinfectant. Um, this minimum dose of greater than one joule per centimeter squared is much, much higher than doses that have been previously said to be effective for surface decontamination. Um, so it's a valid question as to, you know, why have the previous literature said I can use this much, much lower dose to decontaminate, whereas now for N95s, I need to increase the dose so much. Um, the reason is thought to be due to the attenuation of the UVC light as it passes through the layers of the N95. Um, so the higher doses are required to decontaminate the inner layers of the respirator, um, which see a lower dose than the surface of the respirator. Um, at these high UVC doses, it's logical to wonder whether we're damaging the N95 materials. Um, and evidence from the literature suggests that the N95 will keep its fit and filtration performance uh, after 10 to 20 cycles of one joule per centimeter squared UVC. Um, so similarly to the hydrogen peroxide method, this indicates that the limit on number of reuse cycles is going to be determined by the loss of fit due to donning and doffing the mask. Um, the evidence that we've summarized here, as well as additional sources, are available at our N95 Decon technical report on n95decon.org slash UVC, uh, which contains much, much more information about all of this uh, and a lot more peer-reviewed research uh, to discuss each of these considerations uh, when using UVC. Um, next slide, please. So in summary, the evidence suggests that a germicidal UVC dose of a minimum of one joule per centimeter squared delivered to all surfaces of the N95 mask is likely to sufficiently inactivate viruses similar to SARS-CoV-2 on N95s, um, although the amount of inactivation will actually depend on the N95 model. Um, so you can see our website for more details on which models have been validated for, what, uh, for, for UVC. Um, and it's very important to note that the one joule per centimeter squared dose is absolutely crucial to decontamination. Um, so that dose should be validated during the decontamination cycle with a calibrated UVC sensor. Um, that is a sensor that is specific to UVC and does not absorb at the UVA or UVB range because that might mess, uh, mess up the measurement and not give you a correct uh, reading of when you've reached that one joule per centimeter squared value. Um, so at all of these doses from the evidence, we expect that the limiting factor for N95 reuse cycles will be fit degradation from putting, and take, putting on and taking off the mask alone. Um, finally, it's important to note that the UVC is hazardous to human cells, just as it is harmful to pathogens. Um, so appropriate controls need to be put around uh, to make sure that humans are not exposed to UVC. Um, finally, there are several UV sources, including home UV, sunlight, and sources that output low wavelength UV that are not appropriate for UVC decontamination. Um, more information on the actual application around U of UVC, um, how one might actually implement this if uh, you are interested in doing this in your facility, um, can be found at a webinar we've hosted with MGB um, on our website at n95decon.org slash webinar. And you can also find that on YouTube uh, from the user N95 Outreach. Um, this webinar specifically is meant to convey more of the scientific information and basis around each of these methods. So you can get a good idea of how to evaluate any of these methods if they're being used at your hospital. Um, but implementation details are, can be found on our website uh, and on that other webinar. Next slide, please. So the next and the third and final method I'm going to be talking about is humid heat for decontamination. Um, in general, uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus can be inactivated uh, by a certain amount of heat delivered over a certain amount of time with humidity. Um, so at very high temperatures, uh, you know, as one would expect from you know, standard uh, cycling and, and sterilization techniques, the, at very high temperatures, viruses will be inactivated uh, pretty rapidly. Um, unfortunately, though, if you look at the right side of this plot, the higher the temperature, the higher the risk of damage to the N95 respirator. Um, so it would be nice to say that we could take all of our respirators and just throw them in the autoclave. But unfortunately, this has been shown that high temperatures will damage the N95 fit and or filtration. Um, 
Unfortunately, also at the lower end of the spectrum, uh, you see that lower temperatures will reduce the viral inactivation, so you may not get sufficient decontamination from lower temperatures. Therefore, there's this intermediate range, uh, target range of 70 to 85 degrees Celsius, with a relative humidity of 50 to 85 percent, and a time greater than one hour, that is likely to sufficiently inactivate SARS-CoV-2 on the surface of an N95. Next slide, please. So we'll take a look now at the evidence. Why did we choose this range? Why is this something that's backed up in literature? So if we look first at the coronavirus inactivation, um, there are very few studies on coronavirus inactivation due to heat, um, but a very recent non-peer reviewed study uh, suggests that 70 degrees Celsius dry heat for 60 minutes was able to inactivate SARS-CoV-2 sufficiently on an N95 under lab conditions. Um, it would, uh, the, the, the clarification about lab conditions, um, unfortunately, this study did not include uh, some relevant proteins and uh, uh, media that may be present in a real life hospital setting, for example, from sneeze droplets. Uh, and those proteins and media have been shown to stabilize the virus. So therefore, 70C dry heat for 60 minutes is likely not going to provide any margin of safety for a real life situation. Um, therefore, we recommend a higher temperature, higher humidity, and or longer time than this, which has been validated for SARS-CoV-2 under lab conditions. Um, one promising result is that 50 to 85% humidity has been shown to increase the inactivation rates of flu virus uh, went on N95s and metal. Um, so we expect that increased humidity will also more rapidly inactivate SARS-CoV-2 uh, during heat-based treatments. Um, it's important to note that SARS-CoV-2 is not inactivated by 70C dry heat treatments for 30 minutes. We've seen that this is something that is uh, relatively commonly uh, misunderstood. Um, I think early studies were unclear on what the actual required dose is, and turns out 70C dry heat for 30 minutes is certainly not sufficient for an activation of SARS-CoV-2. Uh, with regards to the N95 mask integrity, uh, many N95 models have been shown to maintain fit and filtration performance uh, up to th uh, multiple 30-minute cycles of 70 to 85C and greater than 50% humidity. Um, and uh, it's important to remember, though, that every N95 model may respond differently to heat. So many models have not yet been tested using these conditions, and it's very important to do the user seal check to ensure that the mask still fits and filtration tests where possible. Next slide, please. So in summary, uh, for, for a bio burden reduction with the heat and humidity method, uh, promising conditions for SARS-CoV-2 inactivation on the surface of an N95 are likely to be 70 to 85 degrees Celsius, greater than 50% humidity for longer than 60 minutes. Um, but data is still limited. Uh, it's important to remember that this method may not inactivate all other pathogens, so there's still a risk for bacterial spores or uh, other pathogens to be contaminating the mask, even after decontamination. So the mask should be treated as if it is still uh, contaminated. Um, for N95 performance, many common N95 models have been shown to retain fit and filtration after five cycles at 85C and 80% humidity for 30 minutes. Um, so that indicates that uh, somewhere around a three-cycle reuse um, is likely to be uh, effective for heat and humidity, and longer cycle times are currently being tested. Um, for implementation details, again, please see our website, n95decon.org slash heat, as well as our previous webinar, which you can find at n95decon.org slash webinar or on YouTube, um, which discuss a couple possible implementations of the heat and humidity method. Um, this ranges from both a large-scale method as well as a smaller-scale method that can be done in standard convection ovens, uh, ones without a direct heating element. Um, it's important to remember that even though this method is very accessible uh, to many around the world, um, bringing contaminated masks home is highly dangerous since it carries significant contamination risk. Um, so decontamination should always be carried out within a hospital or other secure setting. Uh, finally, heat methods have not yet been approved in a, a FDA approved process. Next slide, please. So finally, if there is no other choice, the CDC has listed storing an N95 at room temperature for multiple days as a method for possible decontamination. 
Uh, unfortunately, there's very little data on how long an N95 needs to be left at room temperature to kill the SARS-CoV-2 virus. From the very few data points we do have, it seems that storing the N95 in a clean, breathable container, such as the ones that Nicole described earlier, um, storing it in that container at room temperature for seven days may inactivate the virus, um, whereas storing the mask overnight is certainly not enough time to inactivate the virus. Uh, this method, again, should be used only if there is no other choice for decontamination, um, since it does not protect the wearer against bacteria or mold that may be on the N95. Um, and finally, the N95 should be used by the original owner to maintain fit and prevent possible contamination. Uh, more details on this uh, can be found on our website at n95decon.org slash time, where we have a technical report that analyzes all of the uh, currently uh, existing literature on the time required to inactivate SARS-CoV-2 on the surface of an N95. Um, so that's it for the decontamination section. Um, again, if you want to find more details on implementation, please see our website and our webinar. Um, but I hope that was informative, uh, and I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thanks so much for that overview, Tyler. Uh, for this discussion section, we're actually really fortunate to have three additional technical experts on the line. First, we have Dr. David Rempel. He is a professor of medicine at the University of California, San Francisco. Uh, Dr. Rempel is our technical expert on hydrogen peroxide decontamination. Next, we have two technical experts on chlorine dioxide decontamination. The first is Dr. Christopher Chidsey, a professor of chemistry at Stanford University. And next, we have Dr. Sumner Berenberg, professor at Northeastern University. So Tyler, our first question is for you, and it has to do with uh, the heat in uh, hotter climates. So um, we have a couple of questions that we're sort of combining into one here. Um, in these hotter climates, they are seeing temperatures of around 31 to 32 degrees Celsius and a uh, humidity at about 67%. Uh, can they just use that ambient heat and humidity or simply hang a mirror or hang a mask from a mirror in their car for decontamination purposes? That's a great question, Lynn. Um, yeah, that's, that's a, a, a very valid extrapolation of the results. Unfortunately, those temperatures are not sufficient to inactivate the virus at a high rate. You know, for example, uh, the 70 to 85 C for one hour is required to inactivate the virus. Um, and as you reduce the temperature below that range, uh, it requires exponentially longer amounts of time to inactivate the virus. Um, so what that does mean, though, is that the uh, wait and reuse method in those climates uh, may be likely to be marginally more effective. Um, it's not going to be significantly more effective, um, but storing the mask again at room temperature for around seven days may be sufficient to inactivate. So for you, uh, in a hotter climate, that room temperature may be increased, uh, therefore indicating that the amount of time required may be slightly decreased. But again, it, since the studies haven't been carried out, uh, seven, seven days is still the current recommendation there. We have a follow-up from that. Uh, would seven days at 50 C or 125 degrees Fahrenheit in a heated storage container or greenhouse do the trick? Ah, I see the question. Um, seven days at 50 C in a heated storage container or greenhouse. Um, yes, so seven days at room temperature is likely to inactivate the SARS-CoV-2 virus sufficiently. Um, again, it's important to remember that the mask needs to be stored in a breathable container, so there's no risk of other pathogens growing. Um, so, uh, so given that that is the case at room temperature, at 50 C uh, in a heated container, that is also likely to be the case and probably will be slightly more effective uh, at a higher temperature. Um, but again, it's very important to remember that we don't want to expose the N95 to any direct heating sources. So something like a, a, in a standard oven where you have that heating coil, uh, the direct exposure to that heating element will cause a much higher heat flux to the N95 and may damage it. Um, so if, if one is doing any sort of heating method, it's very important to note that the N95 should not be directly exposed or in direct contact with any heat sources or metal. Thank you so much, Tyler. Um, we have a really commonly asked question about UVC decontamination. How much time is necessary to decontaminate an N95 mask using UVC? 
Yeah, that is a, a great question and it's very important to clarify. Um, so with the UVC method, uh, what matters is not the amount of time that a, a mask is exposed to UVC. Instead, what really matters is the UVC dose that's delivered. So that is the total integrated intensity of light that is delivered over the whole time of exposure. Um, and that dose must be at least one joule per centimeter squared. So that will depend strongly on not only the UVC source that's used, the amount of time that you expose the mask to the source, um, but also how the mask is oriented relative to the source. For example, an N95 mask that is farther away from the UVC bulb may take longer to receive the same dose as one that is much closer. Thank you, Tyler. Um, Lynn, do you have the next question? Yes, so next we have a question for Dr. David Rempel. Dr. Rempel, can you comment more on using liquid hydrogen peroxide submersion for N95 decontamination? What do we know and what do we not know about this method? And can we go ahead and use it in our hospitals given a lack of resources? Yeah, um, Lynn, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, good, okay, and I'm happy to be here. Uh, so liquid hydrogen uh, peroxide looks like a very promising method for decontaminating masks. It's inexpensive. It's pretty easy to do. You would dip the mask in liquid hydrogen peroxide for 30 minutes and then let it dry overnight or maybe for a couple of days. Um, it uh, definitely would kill almost all uh, microorganisms. Um, the troubles are uh, really a couple. One is that um, there may be air bubbles and micro bubbles formed between the liquid and the mask, especially masks that have a hydrophilic surface. And that may block the ability of hydrogen peroxide to kill microorganisms. And so there's some research underway to figure that one out. The other is that there's no data yet on whether um, liquid hydrogen peroxide deactivates and de uh, decontaminates um, SARS-CoV-2. And the final thing is that the liquid hydrogen peroxide may alter the fit on the mask. And so there are experiments underway to address all three of those things but it looks like a pretty promising, easy to execute method, but there's some more research that needs to be done that should be done in the next few weeks. Wonderful, thank you. And then I think Marianne has a couple of questions for the chlorine dioxide, Dean. Yes, um, Sumner and Chris, a question that comes up sometimes is whether or not chlorine dioxide could be used to decontaminate N95 masks. This is Chris Chibzi from Stanford University. Can you hear me? Um, so chlorine dioxide is a gas at room temperature and is known to be effective in humid uh, environments, 65% relative humidity or greater. It kills bacterial spores to the six log level that um, Tyler spoke about. Um, it, it has been generated and applied using commercial equipment uh, in controlled environments. And uh, there is uh, ongoing work to validate that and achieve uh, emergency use authorization from the FDA, uh, but that has not yet been published. Um, it, um, it doesn't dam at data to date shows it doesn't damage the filtration or airflow. So that's promising. Um, the fit data is somewhat mixed, particularly its effect on the elasticity of headbands depends on the manufacturer, apparently. And then outgassing of chlorine dioxide will be an issue as with hydrogen peroxide. Uh, several hours are probably required, uh, but that data is not yet available. Um, uh, so I think that's a, a brief summary of where it's at. Thank you. Uh, Lynn? Wonderful. So next we have a question for Tyler. In a situation where I only have a vented N95, can I use it for medical care or under what conditions can it be used? That is a fantastic question. Um, actually, correct me if there's any uh, uh, things that I, I mess up here. Um, to my knowledge, uh, if you only have a vented N95, unfortunately what that means is that the, everyone around you uh, is not protected from your exhaled breath. Um, and as a healthcare worker, uh, that indicates that if you were to become sick, uh, then you might transfer the virus to all of your patients, which would be uh, quite a bad event. Um, so therefore, if you only have a vented N95, uh, I think it is 
more effective instead to just use surgical masks uh, as Ashley showed in her infographic. Ashley, is that correct? I'd say it depends on what you're trying to achieve. So potentially you could also layer a surgical mask over the top of the N95 to add an additional layer of protection, um, but it won't be as good at preventing your risk of transmission to others, but it will protect you. So if you have nothing else and you are in a high risk situation, um, that will provide the most protection, but consider layering that with a surgical mask. And I'm seeing some in the chat about taping over the vent. Um, I think taping over the vent may be a possibility. I don't know if that's been fully tested, um, but I think that's something that folks are doing if that's the only mask that they have. Uh, Tyler, there was a question earlier in the chat about um, ethylene blue. Do you have any comment on that? Um, so if ethylene blue is referring to ethylene oxide uh, decontamination, uh, that is something that is being tested extensively. Um, there are a couple concerns with ethylene oxide. So ethylene oxide has been shown, if properly applied uh, in, a, in a controlled setting with experienced personnel, uh, to be effective for decontamination of N95s for uh, all pathogens, meaning it's a sterilant. Um, however, there is still some concerns as to the residual uh, uh, fumes from the ethylene oxide that may be coming off the mask uh, quite a long time after it's decontaminated. Um, so in the US, there are, the CDC has not recommended the use of ethylene oxide for decontamination of N95 for this reason. Um, and I think studies are currently in progress uh, and we will be updating our website as soon as more data comes out on the proper off-gassing time to ensure that masks are not delivering the carcinogenic residue to the healthcare worker. Okay, Tyler, we have, in the interest of time, we're gonna keep it to one last question. Do these decontamination reuse methods and lessons that we've gotten today apply to the N95 masks that have a vent? Yeah, that's a fantastic question. Um, and it's going to depend, again, on the specific method and on the specific model. Um, so as long as guidelines are followed, such as uh, you know, masks containing cellulose should not be used with hydrogen peroxide vapor, um, and checking the exact model as to whether or not that's been validated and how many cycles that's been validated with heat um, is very important. Wonderful. That wraps it up for our questions. Oh, fantastic. Actually, Monica, you want to take this one? Yeah, uh, Tyler, thank you. And thank you to the entire N95 Decon group. This was fantastic. And I heard the session last night uh, was fantastic as well. As you can see here, um, there are various ways to contact the N95 um, Decon group as well as Assist International. Um, we do, we have set up a WhatsApp group. If we want to go to the next slide, please. We're, there is the QR code here to connect uh, on the WhatsApp chat to keep this conversation going as it is really, really important. Again, thank you to the entire N95 Decon group for this fantastic session. Um, and thank you to everyone who joined. We really appreciate it. We ran long, but we think it was really important.